Yes, Histokan is a very small startup, uh, and that's not going to be the focus of today's talk, but hopefully at future, once we get more data about the digital histopathology, I will be also happy to talk about that. So my name is Ahmed. Uh, welcome all once again. Uh, so the title of my talk today is to, uh, to develop uh, quantitative experimental model systems. So when I say uh, experimental model systems quantitatively, we uh, integrate uh, cellular barcoding technology into the uh, cell lines. So that's the one aspect of my uh, research program in my lab, which I'm going to show you today on a published study. And the second aspect of my lab uh, research interest is to develop uh, patient-derived organoids. So we develop these organoids from the metastatic colorectal cancer patients. So at the last part of my talk, I'm going to show you some unpublished data about how we establish those organoids. So, so tumor is a very complex uh, tissue, as most of you are very familiar. And this complexity uh, mainly uh, arises not only from the cancer cells, but also in the uh, supporting uh, tumor stroma. So this heterogeneity, uh, mainly phenotypic heterogeneity in the tumor stroma, caused by mainly uh, the fibroblast and which they turn into cancer associated fibroblasts through the course of the uh, tumor progression. And these uh, can, sorry, these, uh, okay, these cancer cells uh, initially uh, uh, progress in the primary tumor site and they then have an ability to break the basement membrane and then through this they can intravasate in the recirculation. And through the circulation, the successful clones, which then they can be extravasating to the secondary site, and they can see it, and they can successfully uh, metastasize in the secondary site. Actually, this is a critical point, because 95% uh, of the patients uh, who lose their life from the patient, uh, who lose their life from the cancer, is those the uh, metastatic cancer uh, patients, not the uh, primary cancer patients. So these uh, ability of cancer cells, uh, which they can successfully proliferate, they can escape from uh, tumor suppressive signals, and they can be immortal, and they can follow this invasive and metastasis cascade, are actually being uh, summarized very well back in the 2000s. In 2000, as you all know, these two important scientists, uh, Doug Hanahan and Bob Weinberg, published this landmark study, Hallmarks of Cancer. And now it's 22 years later, just about two months ago, we observed an uh, update on these hallmarks of cancer. And uh, it was only by the Doug Hanahan this time. And this uh, nice illustration now shows us some additional hallmarks into these famous hallmarks of a cancer. And importantly, this uh, phenotypic plasticity, which we often see uh, in cancer cells through the ep epithelial to mesenchymal transition, is often results in the, one of the mechanisms to cause uh, drug resistance. And we also see uh, the importance of the epigenetic reprogramming and the polymorphic microbiome, especially in the colon uh, tissue, and also the uh, senescent cells, which may we may see long years of dormancy of the cancer cells in a tissue and where the chemotherapy will no, will no longer be effective uh, either because these dormant cells are pausing their cell cycle in that uh, process. So these steps, how a normal cancer cell can become a tumor genetic and follow the acquisition of the series of mutations have actually been de documented very well back in the 1976 by another famous scientist called uh, Peter Noel. So Peter Noel uh, depicted this picture in a way showing the, proposing the uh, tumor evolution hypothesis. So what this hypothesis tells us is the following. So you have one normal cell and this normal cell gains, acquires a new mutation, but only if this mutation gives a proliferative advantage, like increasing fitness in this cancer cell, 
then you start to see a growth of a uh, similar number of cells with the same genetic makeup. And this is basically actually the definition of a clone emerging in the primary site. And when this growth observed, and if the tumor growth clone is not antigenic, it can continue to grow and do dominate the primary site. And this clone can even migrate to the secondary site and can form the metastasis in the secondary site. And even under the presence of the drug, even the more aggressive one can be selected. So all this story and the flow is actually the principles of the uh, clonal, clonal evolution, which has been proposed back in the 1976. So from 1976 to around uh, 2010s, this area of research hasn't been studied in depth until in 2010s, where we observed this another seminal uh, study by again very important two scientists, uh, Mal Greaves and Carlo Meili, on the field of uh, cancer evolution. So you may also recognize this picture is very much similar to the uh, Peter Novel's picture in 1976, with some additions on it. As you can see, some clones are here larger and with the different colors. So this actually is showing us that with the different colors, we do see some heterogeneity uh, in the different parts of the tumors. And we also often see here that the different terms called ecosystems, and these ecosystems are the, uh, showing us that the role of the tumor microenvironment, which can be, which can apply a certain uh, selective pressure for the selection of the clones. So the reason after 2010s, this area of research has taken a big interest was due to actually the, uh, the next generation sequencing technology started to enter our life more often. So at the beginning of 2010s, uh, we started to see a series of papers doing uh, amplicon-based NGS or targeted panel NGS or exome sequencing and recently, uh, the whole genome sequencing uh, approaches to understand the clonal diversity and the drug resistance and the selection of the clones are under the drugs in those processes. So one of the seminal uh, and one of the first studies uh, show this is coming from the, by the Marco Gerlinger in 2012. So in the renal cancer patient, uh, Marco did Marco basically uh, collected multiple biopsies instead of one single site of the biopsy from this tumor. And by means of sequence in the NGS, they uh, frame the clonal relationship uh, in this tumor. So the VHL mutation, which is common in all of the samples they analyze, and they uh, concluded this like, as a clonal in all of the uh, tumor samples. But when you go to the edges of the phylogenetic tree, you start to see some more, some more uh, private mutations which are specific to only the certain uh, biopsy samples who are taken from this patient. So these are the list and series of some of the uh, selected uh, papers uh, we observed uh, mainly in the past 10 years. Uh, focusing to understand the clonal evolution in uh, various cancer types. So, so far I summarize you that uh, we have a technology, we, get, we can get a tumor and we can sequence it and we can show you that uh, there is a clonal relationship uh, between the different uh, samples. But, and, and based on that uh, sequencing data, if there is an actionable driver, and if there is a drug available, you can offer that drug to patient, which is called targeted therapy, and to, to observe the success of the therapy or not. So it often results in a success story at the initial phases of this uh, treatment, but then due to uh, clonal, clonal selection and selection of the aggressive clones, we do often observe the uh, relapse in those patients. This is one of the uh, very famous example you may have seen in different talks as well. This is a melanoma patient, and this patient, uh, after sequencing, they identified they have a V600E uh, variant in the BRAF gene, and luckily for that variant, uh, there is a uh, drug available, which is called Vemurafenib, and after 15 weeks of uh, treatment with this drug, as you can see, 
is nearly gone. The patient looks uh, very healthy. But unfortunately, in the following uh, eight weeks, uh, tumor relapse. So how does this occur? Is one of the uh, biggest questions in the, in the field, actually. And there has been uh, mechanisms which were proposed uh, how this uh, selection might be occurring under the drug. So there are two uh, proposed hypotheses. One of them has uh, this uh, resistant drug might be pre-existing uh, in the population before the treatment. And when you apply the treatment, you may select this pre-existing clone. And then you do see the selection of that pre-resistant uh, subclone in your uh, setting. Or through the course of treatment, you may start seeing uh, the acquisition of randomly selected new clone, which is called uh, de novo selection. But in the real case scenario, it's not that simple in the patient. And you often see these two mechanisms are intermixed, and you, you may often see these two are acting in, in one patient under certain, certain uh, treatment, uh, which, makes the, uh, which makes the treatment of the cancer patients, of course, uh, harder. So all these uh, observations also bring us to the topic that uh, intratumor heterogeneity. So as you can see here, uh, different tumor types may have distinct uh, genetic heterogeneity, which are represented by distinct uh, clones. In this case, uh, the yellow clone might be dominating uh, this tumor type, while the purple one might be uh, just simple uh, subclone. But you would never know if this was going to be selected under the therapy or before the therapy through the course of the uh, tumor growth. And when you apply the therapy, as you can see, you may be able to eliminate these red clones, but you may select this blue one, or you may just have a completely new subclone just being emerged after the therapy. So that makes the whole uh, cancer treatment, of course, very difficult. So considering all of these difficulties, one of our interests when I was in the Andreas lab in, at the ICR, uh, okay, we often see these uh, treatment schedules and uh, we have patients, you can sequence it and you can offer a treatment. But how about in the lab? How about if we can mimic, if we can recapitulate these dynamics in the lab? And of course, in an experimental setting, can we establish a system that we can get very close to the patient setting, experimentally speaking. And to be able to do that, uh, we visited some uh, evolutionary principles. So, and then we observed what's happening in the uh, treatment of the patient in the hospitals. <clears throat> so one of the, uh, one of the issue that we taught uh, in the, uh, in the current way of uh, studying drug resistance in the, in, in the lab settings, they weren't really following the evolutionary uh, principles, and they weren't really suitable to study uh, cancer evolution. One of the reasons for that, uh, they weren't following the uh, big population sizes. Imagine a patient's tumor, we have like a trillions of the cells, cell numbers in that tumor, but when you wanna uh, establish a, a drug resistance experiment in your lab, you, you may be just only working with the biggest flask possible, which is which can take up to maybe 10 million cells. So one of our goal was to increase that cell number in our experimental setting, which I'm gonna show you in the next uh, slide how we found a solution for that. And then another uh, problem that we identified is that uh, in the traditional way of studying drug resistance in the lab, you often start with the IC50 or even low drug concentration and you gradually increase this dosing, right? But in the patient, they don't do it like that. So clinicians go sometimes very hard. They can even go and treat the patient with high concentrations. So in our setting, we wanted to overcome this barrier and we wanted to uh, treat the cell lines with a very high drug doses, which I'm gonna show you in the following, following slides. And again, in the traditional setting of the studying uh, drug resistance, so you often, uh, you have a limited uh, flask and you often have to do passaging, right? So these experiments might take uh, six months or eight, year, eight months. And then once the population size reaches this carrying capacity, you have to do passaging. And every time you do passaging, 
You're basically introducing a bottleneck into your system, right? So you don't want to miss any clones. Any clones might be responsible developing a resistance in your setting. So you don't want to do that. So the, the, the system we established, we didn't interfere with the system from beginning until, until the end of the experiment, which I'm going to show you in the following slide. And these uh, bottlenecks, which can cause uh, increasing the genetic drift in your system, and you may lose uh, the existing intratumor heterogeneity in your population. And then if the length of the experiment is too long in a traditional setting, you may then be opening a possibility to generate random new de novo mutations in your context, which you don't want to do that. And uh, these de novo resistance are highly uh, stochastic and it's very unpredictable uh, in your experimental setting. So to overcome these barriers, we, we had a hard thinking on this and we, we really explored uh, what's happening in the different uh, fields. And uh, we came up with these hyperflasks. So these hyperflasks are, imagine a T175 flask, and this is the 10 layers of that. So you can basically grow 10 times more cancer cells in your normal lab setting. So the reason we follow this, as you may recall in the first slide, we wanted to increase the uh, population size, right? We weren't really exactly very close to the patients still, but this was the maximum we thought we could do in one setting in the, in the controlled environment in the lab. And I'm going to show you in the next slide, but uh, we wanted to quantify the ongoing selection and intratumor heterogeneity uh, in this setting. For this purpose, we labeled each of the single cell with a cellular barcoding technology, which I have a slide to explain that. So what we did was we labeled the uh, initial population before any treatment, starting the experiments. And then we divided uh, this initial population after being expanded, of course, into the total eight hyperflas. So these eight hyperflas included for one drug, gefitinib, three biological replicates, and for another drug, second drug, trametinib, another three biological replicates, and we also had uh, the MSO controls. So we focused on, on non-small cell line cancer cell line, HCC827, and this cell line has an EGFR mutation, and EGFR pathway is highly activated. So that's why we wanted to generate our drug-resistant cell lines using two specific inhibitors from this pathway. One was for the EGFR, and one was for the MEK1 and 2 at the bottom of the pathway. So, as you recall, we wanted to uh, treat them with a high concentration. For this purpose, we treated them with GI99 concentration of these two drugs. And this is just a schematic showing how the uh, experiment was run. So, with one drug, under gefitinib, we started to hit them, and the population dynamics, we observed the population is going down in the following week. And in total four weeks, we observed the population grow back to maximum carrying capacity. So every week, we were changing a medium and putting a fresh drug in this setting. And for the second drug, trametinib, actually this experiment took nine weeks. So they were way more slow growing under the treatment. But eventually, at the week nine, week 10, total treatment of nine weeks, we observed uh, they reach cells reach their carrying capacity in the hyperflask. So that was our endpoint. So we harvested all of the cells. We had some uh, sampling for different assays, which I'm going to show you in the following slides. So one of the one of our interests was also to test uh, clonal evolution happening in our context to find out if we. Uh, make resistant cell lines under gefitinib and trametinib, whether or not and at the end of this uh, selection process, will there be some second line treatment options might be sensitizing this population as well, which I'm going to show you a couple of slides later. So that's the idea of a collateral sensitivity. So I haven't put a slide to explain that, but I can briefly introduce that. So this collateral sensitivity idea is coming actually from uh, antibiotic studies in the bacteria. So you do give uh, certain treatment to bacteria, 
And then when the bacteria becomes resistant to that antibiotic, they can be, they might be sensitive to any second line uh, treatment option. So that area of research hasn't been studied a lot in, in cancer research. And we wanted to focus on that, as a, that one as well. So our question was, whether gefitinib resistant cell lines might be sensitive to any second line, or whether trametinib resistant cell lines might be resistant to any second line. Right. So going back to the barcode, so this is a, a technology which was published in 2015 uh, in the Nature Medicine paper from Bang et al. And this is a simple lentiviral vector backbone, uh, and it has 30 nucleotide barcode sequence, and this sequence doesn't exist in our genome, in the human genome. And this library has up to 10 million distinct barcodes in the pool that you can request on the edge gene because it's a published paper. You can buy it with a very, with a very small amount. It's not uh, commercial based to your lab. So the good thing is that there is a consensus uh, forward and reverse primer. Uh, the most important and the most tricky part is to infect your cell lines with a very low MOE uh, number. The reason for that, you want to ensure you put one single barcode per cell. Because imagine you have the initial population, right? So in, in your initial population, you want to label each cell with a distinct barcode. So at the end of your experiment, uh, by doing simple Amplicon NGS, which is not that expensive, you can also please remember that you need to have a three biological replicates in parallel. Why? Statistically speaking, if you want to find out if the mechanism of resistance is pre-existing in your population, you want to check those three biological replicates. So if the same barcodes are enriched under the same drug, in those three biological replicates. So you can say with a high confidence, those barcodes might be responsible as a pre-resistant mechanism of resistance. But at the end of your drug treatment, if you do detect random barcodes in each, your, in each of your biological replicates, then you can say they are not pre-existing, but they are randomly occurring barcodes through the course of your treatment. So this is what we actually did. So uh, these is, we called the initial population uh, pot, and then we had two uh, DMSO controls, and we had, uh, as you recall, uh, three gefitinib replicates, parallel replicates, and we had three trametinib parallel replicates. So we observed here gefitinib-specific barcode selection with a higher frequency under the gefitinib treatment. We do also observe Trametinib specific uh, barcode enrichment. Interestingly, we also observed a barcode were all selected in both uh, treatment uh, cycles, which were represented by the uh, orange color. So this indicated us that there was an ongoing selection. So we were able to generate drug resistant cell lines in our setting. And the Barcode distribution told us that there was a polyclonal, polyclonal uh, drug resistance was taking place. And because majority of the high frequency barcodes were pre-existing, we concluded is that uh, more pre-existing uh, polyclonal drug resistance than Denovo was taking in place in our setting. So we continue to assess and understand the underlying molecular uh, mechanisms for the drug resistance. First and first, uh, we did uh, dose response curve with our three biological gefitinib replicates in comparison to their uh, DMSO uh, derived and the initial population. And we also did the same thing for the trametinib resistant cell lines. As you can see, we, do ob we did observe uh, a big shift in the uh, drug resistant cell lines in comparison to their control. Then we wanted to understand what might be genetic drivers of these uh, drug resistance. So we did whole exome sequencing and specifically to GEF biological replicates, we observed meta amplification while we didn't see any change in the trametinib uh, groups. 
And also in the trametinib groups, we did observe CDK2NA loss while CDK2NA loss wasn't, uh, wasn't, wasn't the case. Uh, in the gefitinib resistant uh, cell lines. So observing these two genetic uh, alterations made us to think there might be pot possibility to intervene and treat those drug resistant cell lines to see if the collateral, collateral sensitivity uh, was in place. So before I move on that, I want to introduce you here one of the very side uh, project side thinking we came up during the uh, during the project, which is a half, which was halfway through, and we want to try this, and it ended up uh, very uh, I think nice, which I'm going to show you now. So you you know the system now. So this is the system in the hyperplast. So one experiment was four weeks, another experiment was nine weeks, and every week we were changing the medium, and we were putting the fresh track, right? So we thought we shouldn't really throw away the used medium. And these are the barcodes which goes into the genome, into the DNA. And when the cells starts dying, which are which they were floating in the used medium, that because that's DNA, you could harvest it, you can spin it down, and then extract the DNA. And we wanted to test whether we could catch, we could detect barcodes from the used medium. But one thing you need to be aware of here is that majority of the cells in the floating medium are sensitive cells, right? The dying cells because of the drug. So their barcode frequency, expected barcode frequency, should be very low, right? Because they are not selected. But by means of natural cycle, because not all of the healthy cells that attach are attached, very few of them can still go into the floating medium. And because this technology is very sensitive, it's amplicon based, and you know which barcode to chase from your end population. So we were able to only focus on those and we were able to capture them. So this allowed us like non-destructive, so we weekly basis, like a temporal uh, quantification and chasing of the barcode in our system. So very interesting point in here, that that's the final point where you harvested your population and you did barcode analysis, right? So you know which barcodes came up with a high frequency in your setting. And sequencing all of these time points from the used medium, then you, you have a potential to chase those individual sequences because when you sequence your barcode, you know which sequence that you're gonna chase. And we were able to capture them. And very interestingly, some of them were able to match, nearly match to the final point. So every week in your population that you are harvesting, so some subclone started to grow in your attached cell and they were going to the floating medium and you were able to capture them by means of the barcode sequencing. So this was like, this was very exciting to us. We thought at the time this is very close to the ctDNA studies, right? So you get the blood and you can monitor in a time dependent manner. So going back to this um, uh, MET and CDK2NA loss, MET amplification and CDK2NA loss. So we did some validation. They were whole exome. Uh, we did some DDPCR, simple DDPCR, and we observed yes, MET copy number was high, and yes, CDK2NA uh, was loss. So then we looked at the literature whether or not for these actionable drivers is there any uh, inhibitor is available. And for MET amplification, yes, there is one uh, uh, drug targeted therapy is available, captamatinib. And for CDK2NA loss, uh, kind of indirectly, yes, uh, there is a therapy available because CDK2NA loss negatively regulates CDK4 and 6. So we uh, hypothesize that maybe we can use uh, palbociplib if CDK4 and 6 levels were high. So, very interestingly, uh, we realized the reason uh, later, which I'm going to show you in the next slide. So when we did these experiments in the bulk population of the cells, resistant population of cells, we did not see any change. These uh, drugs were uh, increasing the sensitivity in these drug resistant cell lines. So this was a little bit of a pausing point for us and we started to investigate this further. And one of the ideas we got, whether maybe because of the heterogeneity in the population, 
not every cell, not every clone is not the same, which was apparent from the, from the clinical studies. To, to, to further dive into that, we did some single cell, uh, cell line establishment. So we sorted single cells, and from each single cell, we derived another cell line. And we wanted to assess those each single cell derived cell line, their sensitivity against those drugs, which I'll show you a slide before. So to do this, we use this machine, which is called Cell one And uh, the advantage of this machine is that you can see what you are sorting, different than facts. Because in facts, you often might have like doublets or maybe triplets or when sometimes there is no cell. We really wanted to make sure we are really dealing with a single cell. So there are some examples. So these single cells have been sorted into 96 cell plate and then we gradually changed the plate, went to the bigger flask. And this took us around like three to four months, but eventually we had some uh, single cell derived cell lines from these drug resistant populations. So first thing first, first, thing first we did uh, the copy number assessment by the DDPCR for our target. And for MET copy number, interestingly, as you can see, one of the single cell derived clone didn't have any MET copy number amplification. So this was kind of supporting our thinking. Not every single cell in the population had the bulk MET copy number that we observed from the polyxome sequencing and then followed by the DDPCR. And also interestingly, other clones that we established had way more higher MET copy number than the bulk. So this kind of encouraged us because if these clones had more MET copy number, then maybe this drug captametinib might be more effective. Because it wasn't effective when the copy number was doubled in the bulk. Maybe this addiction to MET might cause increased sensitivity in our setting, which was kind of the turning point for the project and which was very exciting. And we did observe increased sensitivity with these two clones, which had way more higher MET copy number than the bulk population. So we did the same for the CDK2NA loss clones. As you can see, uh, we didn't observe any clone less than half of the uh, bulk that we observed. So this may already be, be saying us something, maybe the CDK2NA, which is also cell cycle related, might be very crucial for these uh, cells to not to lose uh, more than half. We anyway continued uh, this experiment and uh, as expected, because in the bulk population where the copy number loss was half, we didn't see any change. And then in the single cell clones as well, when the loss was only half, we didn't observe any change. So this didn't stop us for this trimetinib side of the story. We wanted to do more like a systematic and general approach. And we decided to do some uh, high throughput drug screening, whether or not we might be able to capture some maybe cell cycle related proteins uh, might be you know, talking with the, and interacting with the CDK2NA or some other uh, targets, then that might then lead to maybe some combination therapies rather than single uh, treatment as a second line. So let me briefly introduce you this platform, uh, you, which you may be interested at some point in your work to try maybe. So this is a high throughput platform and it works on based on the uh, ultrasound technology. And it works on the nanoliter range. So, uh, because you want to put very low amount of your drug to your uh, cell lines, right, in your platform. So, in this setting, uh, we, we work with 450 uh, drugs, and the, we were able to uh, basically check 72 384 well plate uh, in one day. So once you see everything, because it's, a, it's, it's way more simpler, you can just see everything in one day, up to 72 plates. And then uh, you just basically stack this onto the machine, and machine does everything for you. Just brings the mother plate, 
and close to your uh, cell lines. And then through the ultrasound, they can disperse the drugs to each specific well. And then you can do uh, cell viability assessment. So we have got some very interesting uh, targets and they were all very uh, cell cycle uh, specific on the top of the list, which we think they might be able to uh, increase sensitivity for the trametinib resistant uh, cell line derived from a single cell. So this part of the work, uh, which uh, we haven't finalized yet, so the plan, one of the plan is to either try them alone or in combination with the palbociplip to see if it is successful to uh, increase sensitivity in the trametinib resistant uh, group. So, so far, I've shown you the, uh, the genetic uh, determinants of the resistant in our system by means of uh, barcode sequencing and the whole exome sequencing. Now, in this part of the work, we also assessed at the single cell level whether or not is there any phenotypic uh, heterogeneity is taking place. And the question was to uh, then identify what it might be. So, this is just a brief history of the uh, single cell sequencing technology where we are now mainly through the 10x genomics is, is very much established and is one of the standard and routine protocols. And of course, if you are financially able to try that. And before then, uh, it basically, in my view, originated from this uh, famous study in, back in 2015 in a very homemade system uh, using the DropSeq platform. So in our context, you recall, we had a gefitinib resistant cell line and we had a trametinib resistant cell line. We basically performed uh, the single cell sequencing, single cell RNA sequencing. And you do see here uh, two, you do see here one big cluster, which is derived from the trametinib resistant group. And I forget to mention, this is our initial population, POT. That's what we name it. And interestingly, we did observe two distinct clusters for the uh, gefitinib resistant uh, group. Although I put the names in here, but I'm going to explain you in the following slides what's going on in these uh, clusters. So let's start with the gefitinib resistant uh, uh, cell line. And as you recall, we have two distinct uh, clusters. And in one of the clusters, uh, as expected, there was a MET uh, copy number gain, and this cluster was the one uh, also highly expressing uh, MET. But the other cluster didn't have that much higher MET expression. So what was going on in the other cluster of the GEF resistance, which is in the slide after, which I left it for the last slide. And in the uh, trametinib resistant one, we were able to confirm CDK2NA expression was downregulated, and the in the one of the clusters of the gefitinib resistant, excitingly, we observed uh, the presence of the EMT, epithelial to mesenchymal transition. As you can see clearly, epithelial marker was nearly gone, and the vimentin, the mesenchymal mar marker, was highly upregulated. So that's one of the mechanisms uh, in the literature. It's also been it's also been reported as a mechanism of resistance, mechanism of resistance for the drug resistance. And uh, we were also happy to observe that this was also the case uh, in our setting. So I'm going to give you a brief summary of what I've shown you so far, and then I'm going to switch you to show you some unpublished data. Uh, I'm, I'm going to slightly change the topic, and I'm going to move forward to the uh, patient-derived organoids. So, uh, so far, uh, this, uh, this is a published study in, uh, in 2020, and the in that study, we showed uh, our system, which is which, are, which we believe is evolutionary informed, because of the design of the experiment, we considered the evolutionary uh, evolutionary principles to adapt into the our system, and in this system, uh, we were able to quantify the ongoing intratumor heterogeneity and the presence of the intratumor heterogeneity with the power of this cellular barcoding technology. And this allowed us, like in ctDNA studies, temporary track the evolution in our system without damaging the population, without harvesting. And our barcode analysis showed that, that there are polyclonal resistance, and mostly dominated by the pre-existing clones, was taking place. And we were able to observe collateral sensitivity in 
one of the cell line when we did single cell derived cell lines. But in the bulk cell cell lines, we weren't able to observe the collateral sensitivity. This also highly indicates and encourages maybe that we need to move on more single cell studies to really understand ongoing uh, subclonal uh, diversity in, in the setting. And finally, if you were also able to observe phenotypic heterogeneity by means of a single cell RNA seq experiment, and uh, EMT was one of the mechanisms responsible for the drug resistance in the gefitinib resistant cell lines. So that's all. Uh, I don't know the time. I don't know if it's fine. Okay. Uh, so I just want to say thank you. Uh, this is the lab I worked in London with Andrea. He is now in the Human Technopole. And uh, Julio, my colleague, he is working at the Trieste at the moment. And the, the, that's the first part of the study which is published. And this is my lab in Ankara. And this is the team uh, members in my lab. Uh, we have some more ongoing works, but they were, with, they were kind of the middle phases. So I didn't want to bring up here and then, you know, get you confused. Uh, that's why I briefly introduce you our organoid technology and the, uh, these are the funding bodies from London and these are my uh, funding organizations uh, in Turkey. And this is one last thing, there is an ongoing uh, special issue, uh, it's still open for submission uh, in frontiers, of, uh, frontiers in Genetics. So if you are interested in, uh, feel free to submit a paper on the cancer evolution topic. Thank you.